Good evening. Welcome to the inaugural uh, City Council meeting for the 2016-2017 term of this Northampton City Council. This is uh, January 5th, 2016. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, presiding for now uh, for this first meeting of this year. And uh, we're, we're uh, informally going to, I'm going to welcome Dennis Bidwell, who takes his seat here as uh, the Ward 2 Counselor. This is, this is his initiation, and we will be gentle. And <laughs> welcome, Dennis. And Thank you very much. I'm you. expecting some sort of hazing ritual. For the, uh, that was it. Newbie, Hope you enjoyed it. Next two years, <laughs> next two years we'll, be, we'll serve that. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. It's as crazy as it gets here. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, the first order of business is we, um, this is actually kind of a, vestigial tale of sorts of our old rules but we have to we have to uh, nominate and uh, we have to vote in the appointment of the administrative assistant and then um, should that be successful and I, I'm feeling pretty good about the chances then um, uh, Councilor Murphy in his august position of I think you're a notary or you uh, justice of the justice as a JOP uh, will swear in whomever we happen to appoint <laughs> um, it's possible that we may consider as we, be, when we go into accepting our rules that maybe this is a rule that doesn't really apply anymore um, the no other municipal employee has to take an oath every two years so we they're, they're just sort of that, that seems kind of strange but in any event I'll accept the nomination um, for an appointment to the administrative assistant position um, uh, I, yes, I would like to make a motion that we place it on the floor and vote for Pam Powers as the administrative assistant to council clerk. Okay, the motion's made and seconded, and, and yeah, okay. Uh, any discussion on the nomination? Um, any other nominations? Um, I. All those in favor move of closing to close, nominations? Move to close nominations. Second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now, before you is the nomination of Pamela Powers to serve as administrative assistant to the city council. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I like, as I said, I like your chances. Pam is administrative assistant. Councilor Murphy, would you do the honors, please? So we Absolutely. Actually, we practiced yesterday, so okay, we're really good, good at this. All right. <laughs> all right, you're going to stand up and raise your right hand. I'm a and since it's only you, I'm going to give you your name. All right? Just so there's no mistakes. Okay. I, Pamela Powers, I, Pamela Powers, do solemnly swear, solemnly swear to faithfully and impartially, to faithfully and impartially discharge the duties as administrative assistant to the city council, dis to discharge the duties as the administrative assistant to the city council, in accordance with the rules and laws, in accordance with the rules and laws of the city of Northampton, of the city of Northampton, the constitution of this commonwealth, the constitution of this commonwealth, and the ordinances of the city of Northampton, and the ordinances of the city of Northampton, to the best of my knowledge and ability, to the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thanks. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I love this town. Um, okay, thank God, <laughs> Pam's, Pam's now firmly in place. Um, next, now that we have an administrative assistant, I will ask Pam to please call the roll. Okay, Councilor Adams here. Councilor Bidwell here. Councilor Carney present. Councilor Dwight yes here. Councilor Klein here. Councilor Labart present. Councilor Murphy here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. We have a quorum, and we'll have to talk to counts, uh, the solicitor Seawall because we we just had a vote without actually convening, so I'm not sure how that works. But um, okay. <laughs> well, when we get to that point, I, I think the fact is I think is generally accepted. And should there be a challenge, I'm prepared to go to court on this one. I understand, so. I understand your point. We voted without actually convening. We just convened now with a roll call. After we voted. Yeah. Right. So I don't, I don't know how that Do plays again. out in the grid. I, I suggest we not overthink it and move on. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Point well taken. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, we have next up on the agenda, speaking of the city solicitor, Alan Seawald is here to, uh, well, it's, he says it's a refresher training, but point in fact, actually, this will be the first training for uh, Mr. Bidwell, and, and I, I think from uh, this refresher will be quite helpful, and this is on open meeting law and uh, various other ethical issues, I think some of which we violated already. Uh, Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, the council, congratulations. Um, thank you as a citizen. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the service. Um, there are two laws, uh, sets of laws that are that are the principal laws that seek to have government in Massachusetts be as open as possible, as transparent as possible. And one of them is the open meeting law, and the, and the purpose of the open meeting law is to assure that your deliberations um, are done in public so that the public knows um, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you are doing it. <laughs> so the, the first general proposition is that um, all meetings must be open to the public. So we're here today, it's open to the public. We can get much of a turnout, but this is a meeting open to the public. It's open to the public because there was adequate notice provided under the open meeting law, uh, notice that was detailed enough to allow the public to know generally what will be transpiring at the meeting, what the topics are that will be discussed at the meeting, and anyone who would wish to attend is welcome to do so. Uh, a meeting is uh, generally defined as a deliberation by a public body with respect to any matter within the body's jurisdiction. And that might sound kind of narrow because, um, you know, we need to meet. When we talk about a meeting, we're talking not about a physical presence, but we're talking about a deliberation, a, a written or oral communication, including email, between or among a quorum of this, of this council. The most common way that, that people like you who want to comply with the open meeting law violate the open meeting law is by email. That is the number one way you, that, that <coughs> innocent violations occur. Do not send any deliberative matter to a quorum of, of your colleagues. That means four others, other than you, and you've reached a quorum. So any time you send out something to more than uh, uh, four or more of your colleagues, you have likely violated the open meeting law. This can also happen in a serial fashion. Counselor Ward one talks to ward two, ward two talks to ward three, ward three talks to ward four, ward four talks to ward five, and before you know it, you have violated the open meeting law. Serial communications among a quorum are not permitted. So, it's my practice, when I send something out to a quorum of a board like this, it is generally something that I want the board or the, the council to read as part of what is going to be discussed at the next session. I always include, please do not reply all, please do not discuss this matter before the meeting with the other counselors. Because you can innocently run into somebody at the stop and shop, <clears throat> and that person runs into in the next couple of people, and before you know it, the violation has happened. So it's the best practice is to keep your conversations public. Now, I know that's not, that's not entirely possible, but I just need you to be very clear that, that, it, that a serial communications can be a violation. Um, there are some exceptions to, to this. Um, On-site inspections of premises, things like that are not meetings. One thing that has come up a few times in my, uh, in my tenure as city solicitor with the council have been counselors attending meetings of subcommittees. 
I know that there was some talk about making your, your rule more stringent than the state law, but let me tell you what the state law is, just so you'll know. Members of the parent body can attend meetings of the, uh, of the sub, sub body and can participate so long as the participation is exactly the same participation as any other member of the community is afforded. So in other words, you cannot be solely allowed to speak to the subcommittee, but you're still a citizen and you can speak. A, a quorum, if there's a quorum present, including the subcommittee, then uh, those who are not on the subcommittee should not be speaking to each other in front of the subcommittee. Okay. Communications are to the subcommittee in exactly the same manner as everyone else in the room is entitled to speak. And I say this because you, you're counselors, but you're also citizens. You don't lose your First Amendment rights. What you lose is the right to deliberate on a matter within your jurisdiction, except at a posted meeting. It's a fine line to walk, I understand, but uh, I'm always available in, in any given situation. Alan, could you just use an example of that? Say four of us counselors attend a planning board meeting and the public is there speaking also but four of you is not a quorum okay so no we went, counselor on the plan if we went all right so so it's not a quorum so then explain what you're actually saying here i'm talking about your subcommittees the council oh, sub subcommittees. your committees okay so if, if you know if you have a three-member finance committee, like ordinance if you have a three-member finance committee and two other members want to attend that finance committee meeting, the finance committee can allow counselors to address the committee. Okay. And counselors can address the committee so long as it's in exactly the same way that the public generally can address the committee. The public is not entitled, it's not a hearing, and the public is not entitled to address the committee, then the counselors aren't entitled to, do, to address the committee. <clears throat> and do we address them as a counselor, um, as a citizen? That's totally up to you. I, I okay. think some citizens call you counselor and some citizens call you Marianne. So whatever you prefer. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, to expand on that a little bit, always the tricky part is, of course, um, if another counselor is attending a subcommittee meeting who is not a member of that body is opining um, and or if there's a back and forth that will certainly constitute deliberation, wouldn't it? Or at least in the eyes of the state. Not if the counselor is <coughs> allowed to speak only in the same way that everyone else so is. So if a citizen were allowed to do a back and forth and exchange right. questions, and then that would be allowable as well? That would be allowable. That, well, I mean, that, I mean what it, then that sounds like it has to do with the custom of the committee then, because committees don't really, committees can be somewhat informal. Um, and, and sort of have you know conversational um, interactions with, with a member of the public, and so um, so that so that's so if a council were afforded that same level of formality, it would be okay. That's my understanding, but that's that's seems, my understanding seems as well. Kind of difficult to determine. I mean, I I think that whatever's going on in the committee, I understand your committees are generally advisory to the council. So whatever's going on in the committee is going to be again addressed at the council. My advice is that's why you should be doing your um, your deliberation over what the committee is doing. So the committee does its business and then comes back to the council, and that's where the deliberation should really take place. So am I encouraging councilors to show up at, at committee meetings and participate in committee meetings? No. I just want to point out that it is permissible as long as it's in the exact same way that the general public is allowed to participate. Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll just touch on on open meeting is that um, there are 10 bases, 10 reasons for holding closed meetings, what we call executive sessions. I'm not going to go through them all now, and um, but I. I and there are very specific 
procedures that have to be followed in order to go into an executive session and whoever it is uh, who is elected your presiding officer, your council president, and I ought to have a conversation about how that happens um, before the next executive session. Um, there, because there are responsibilities for the presiding officer uh, and findings that need to be made by the presiding <coughs> officer before an executive <coughs> session is convened. So um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to just give you, yeah. I do another question. You can go on, but just before I move on, I want to ask something about serial communications. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that, you know, one can't t talk to two, three, four, and five right. in order to, to create a serial communication. but. My understanding, and please tell me if I'm wrong, this is just my understanding, is that a counselor can communicate with other counselors as long as they're not constituting a quorum of the full council or any subcommittee <clears throat> that might have jurisdiction over that issue. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a counselor can't sit there and, like, you know, talk to enough counselors to figure out if they have the support for their measure, for example. That would be serial communication, right? If, so if, if, Councilor A were to call Council B, C, D, and E. Right, and I, without, without disclosing the discussions that they've had, but with the other council. That would be a violation. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, let me, <clears throat> I mean, if there is serial, if there's a serial communication where five counselors in a row have spoken to each other, but they have not shared the views of other counselors, how would they even know that's a violation? That's why having these, these, external deliberations about matters within the jurisdiction of the council is always uh, it's always risky because you just never know when when you speak with four three other counselors when one of those counselors is going to go out and communicate what was said inadvertently without really thinking that it's a violation of, of the law but it is a violation of the law I, I had one one question mm -hmm. back, back to the the trickiness of email communication um, so if if I were to send out an email to my eight colleagues just proposing an idea for consideration that is fine that is fine so long as there is a, that this is a proposal that I would like to take up at the next meeting or uh, something to <coughs> that not, not soliciting any Feedback. As long as the councils aren't communicating with each other about them. And so the, 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 the trickiness would be in the reply. That's <coughs> why my messages of that sort say, please do not reply all, do not reply. This is for discussion at the meeting. Okay. That's the very intent of yep. uh, do not reply all. And yep. when you're communicating with the quorum, please, it's a good idea to include, please do not reply all. Uh, Councilor Sharon, then Councilor Adams. Uh, back to Councilor Adams' point, that makes it hard to produce things, though. I mean, so how, unless you're doing it in isolation, whether it's writing an ordinance or a resolution, if, you, if you know, I mean, how would you cover that? Because if you're talking to one counselor, but you're, you're basically saying don't have those conversations outside. But so how do we? If you're deliberating, um, which is an oral or written communication between or among. Uh, a quorum of public body on any public business within its jurisdiction. Now the question is, there's, there's, um, uh, there is no definition of what public business is within the jurisdiction of the council. And I would say that if you are germinating uh, an idea for an ordinance and you just want to float it out to the other council, it's not a matter of, of within the jurisdiction of the council at that time because there's nothing before the council. But, I mean, it will, you know, if, if the idea does germinate, it okay, will come then, the then your communications are, are in public. <clears throat> so the question is, what's within the jurisdiction of the council at the time of the communication? That's why this is a bit tricky. That's right. Perhaps, there is, uh, hypothetically, there's a, uh, a past measure in ordinance. Can counselors deliberate as a quorum after? You cannot deliberate as a quorum on any matter of that is within the jurisdiction of the council. So that's prior or post passage. Right. If it's within the jurisdiction it's not of the council. Deliberation then, if it's post. It's an oral or written communication through any medium 
between or among a quorum of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction. So it's public business, it's not necessarily deliberation. That's the definition of a deliberation. A deliberation is an oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a quorum of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction. Very broad. Councilor Murphy. <clears throat> um, and we've talked about this before, but a committee, subcommittee chairperson for the purposes of gaining consensus on a date to hold a public meeting is fine. That is fine. So you can communicate to all your subcommittee members, is this Tuesday or next Tuesday Absolutely. at 5 best for a meeting? Yes. And you can all communicate on that yes. because you're simply, you're not, not public no business. substance, you're just communicating yes. on a schedule. Mm -hmm. So that sort of communication is okay. That is communication is all right. Administrative uh, communications are fine. Councilor Adams. And, and you used emails as an example, but text messages to our public records and inclusive yeah. Yeah. as well, right? Mm -hmm. And any medium. Pigeons. And as long as we're on that subject, <coughs> move over um, from open meeting to public records just briefly, because any communication, any record in any form, electronic or paper, that you receive is a public record. It's presumptively a public record. There are exceptions, but it's presumptively a public record. So you have an obligation to maintain and keep those records. Those of you who, like Secretary of State Clinton, use a personal email are putting yourself at some risk that someone will be given permission to snoop through your emails to find public records. Um, I just put that out there. Your private email account does not turn a public record into a private document. <clears throat> if it comes to your personal email and it's a matter of public business, it's a public record, and you need to maintain that record. Um, and you, and, and again, you do subject yourself to uh, scrutiny of your private email uh, for public records. Councilor Adams, if it's a, if it, it's a matter of public. Uh, Anything you receive in your role as a public official, any record made or received in your role as a public official is a public, presumptively a public record. Occasionally, uh, I think we've gotten some like rants that we can't really decipher what are about, but certainly nothing that has to do with anything <clears throat> within our purview. If it's addressed to us in our official capacity, is it a public it's record? Public record. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Murphy. Yeah, I think a, a good example of that was um, there was some sort of communication going on with one of the police unions and one of the members yes, handed sir. a couple of us a document. I remember saying, if you give that to me, it's a public record. Well, you we've know, had we're some we're litigation over this here in the city yeah. because there yeah, was get it. there was a private, um, a meeting of a private board of directors, actually a, a charitable board of directors, and it was sent to our economic development person and- Public record. Came a public record, so their <laughs> private communication became a public record. So. Anything made or received by a public official is presumptively a public record. It, uh, how, it was my previous understanding that we're obliged to keep those emails and transactions for seven years. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Statute of limitations. So that, um, which I, my all five email accounts I've kept since I was first elected, <coughs> and God help the poor person who has to suss through those. But, uh, Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. Oh, just but if it's something that we're concerned about, we could forward it to our clerk and say, I just received this email and I want to share it with you to get it on record. The other thing to, I'll tell you what I do is I like to use my personal office, you know, my, my business email. Um, so all of you are welcome to send things to my Northampton City email address and it gets forwarded to my private email and then I always in the reply, I CC it to myself at my city email. And so it's all going through my city email, even if, though I'm reading it and responding to it on my private you know, business account. So just, just something to think about. 
but do understand that anything you receive in, on paper or by email or by text message are public records if you receive them in your capacity as a public official. Like, it, say, Alan, you have a resident who is very, very upset. Like some of us, mostly all of us counselors would get emails from a resident being very upset about a situation and sometimes the language is not a good language. So that would be a public record? Mm -hmm. There's no exception for documents with bad language in it. There's just no exception <laughs> for that. If you receive it as a city councilor, it's a public record. You need to presume and expect that this will be a public record and if requested, you will have to produce it. We, we have an example of that. Uh, now Mayor Narkowitz as council president received an email from a citizen that was subject to a freedom of information request from former council Bardsley and he submitted I, I don't know if he was actually obliged to submit it but the the mayor did offer it up for for review but freedom of information request um, specific to that email so <coughs> So uh, let me just talk on a little bit on conflict of interest. This is not open, <coughs> not open government issue, but I think it's something that uh, you really need to think about. I always encourage public officials to think about it, and I always encourage you, if you have any question, and what I always say is that if you have a question, then you should definitely be seeking an answer. And if it pops up in your head, you're wondering whether you should do it or not you should find out whether you should do it or not because um, a lot of this is quite intuitive um, <coughs> so as a public official you cannot accept anything of value for doing uh, for doing your job you cannot accept anything for doing your job um, and so um, and as a an official, you can't accept anything of substantial value, which is valued at $50, even if it's not pr quid, quid pro quo for doing your job. Okay. So be very careful about that. You cannot take benefits that others who are not counselors are not entitled to simply because you're a counselor. So be sensitive to that. This is this has sort of come up in a, in a different way, and I think I've spoken to a, a majority of this, this council already about this subject, but it is the ask. Asking for money. Be very careful about asking for money. The way that you can always ask for money <coughs> is in a general ask, a website, a PSA like on the radio or on television, um, a mailing to every address in the city. That's fine. You can ask for people to donate whatever you want them to, oh. them to donate to. But when you start picking out segments of our city and making a, a uh, directed ask or solicitation to segments of our city, it becomes problematic, particularly when the, the segment of our city that you're asking are likely those who have some dealings with the city, whether they need a liquor license or a vitulers license or some other permission um, for something to operate a business or to do whatever. Um, the conflict of interest law prevents you from, from uh, putting that person in a position of feeling coercion, even if you're not intending to be coercive, but to, to uh, be put in a position of feeling coerced uh, or feeling like they would be better off giving to whatever you're asking for, not because of the merits of what you're asking for, but because you're a city councilor and it may be in their best interest to do what the city councilor asks them to do. There is a subtle coercion there that the conflict of interest law seeks to uh, prevent. And, and this is not necessarily exclusive to areas of our authority. It's also our areas of influence or perceived influence by the person. That's right. Or person. So if you're if you're soliciting money for a, a nonprofit that you're on the board of, and someone thinks it might be to their benefit to make you happy by donating, that that would certainly constitute a violation. That's right. So this has it doesn't have anything to do. It's unrelated to whether or not you're doing it. We are doing it in our capacitors as counselors, capacity as counselors. It's, it's totally unrelated to that. I mean, you, you, 
it's it's particularly with certain segments of the city, you would be hard to separate yourself from your role as counselor. Okay. Um, certainly, I would not advise anyone to go out there and say, I'm city counselor XY, and as a city counselor, I'm asking you to make a donation to a private organization. But yes, that is true. Even as a private citizen, if uh, the person you're asking ha is at risk of feeling coerced to do what you're doing for reasons other than purely the uh, the merits of the of the uh, grantee, then it's a violation. So that, uh, as another example, <coughs> say like we had raffle tickets or something, and we went to city employees and departments. Don't that's a no-no. That. That's a no-no. How about in this age of social media? If there's a posting on a Facebook page, for instance, which is to everyone, presumably, then that that's I put that in the category of a PSA or a website, or um, you know, as long as it's broadcast generally and not targeted. Um, uh, yeah, Councilor, that's Councilor Klein and then Councilor Shara. Well, I, I think we're asking the same. Right. Question. I feel like we've had the conversation about that specifically before, and I think what you had said is you have. I mean. It's general, but you have a certain selected group of, group of friends, right? You People opt in to be your Facebook friend, let's say. So <coughs> that is sort of a description. Uh, maybe I misunderstood. I thought a, a Facebook page for whatever you're collecting for and not oh, okay. your personal Facebook page. That would I'd have to do that on a case-by-case. -case. And most of this really, I encourage you, and, I, and you all know who you are. I've spoken to more yeah. than just a few of you about this. and. This is very fact specific. I just want to. It, this is more of a caution than than giving you definitive ground rules. But um, you know, you can say that anyone who actually had, does business with the city council, if you're a city councilor and you're going to that person asking for money, that's a no-no. Okay, that is one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is something generally broadcast, like on the radio or on TV. And there are gradations in between those two polar extremes, and that's what either I'm here for, or you could go to the State Ethics Commission directly, and they will give you uh, an opinion. It won't be quick, but they'll give you an opinion. So, like with benefits, say we're asked as a consular to help with a benefit. It depends on what the help is. It just depends on what the help is. You can. You know, if they're asking you to go on TV and say that there's a benefit for this great organization, please go and. But we don't handle money, or we don't do anything. You're like not that. asking for money. You're asking exactly. people to attend a benefit, and you're not asking people for money. Oh, sorry, Adams. Can you explain the scope of? <coughs> well, can you explain more about not accepting gifts of fifty dollars, or more, and S if that, if, go, go ahead. Um. Uh, someone with whom you interact in the city says, I've got these great tickets to a Celtics game. Here you go. It's a no no. You better pay for them. Unrelated to being a counselor. That's, that's the factual question that needs to be answered. Oh, if it's your brother, that would probably be okay. But if it's somebody you have no relationship with other than you being a counselor, then it's probably not okay. Um, I'm not going to give you a, a bright line here. I'm just telling you that, that um, you know, any payment quid pro quo, if you do this, I'll give you that, is prohibited. Oh, sure. yeah. That's, well, that's, obvious. that's I, obvious. I'm thinking about more. Um, but, you know, there are people, and maybe not counselors, but there are other people who, there are organizations with whom we sign contracts who would be very happy to give the mayor tickets or somebody else tickets or the license commissioners tickets or whatever and they've already done their job it's not it's not a quid pro quo but it's illegal i was thinking more along the lines <laughs> of i you know I'm, I'm i have a i'm a lawyer in private practice and i have a client who i did some work for and then they send me a gift card for a hundred dollars saying you know because it's that, not a problem i said i can't take that because i'm a public oh, that's official. okay no and that's why it's it's really fact-based that person obviously is giving you that because you did a good job in their legal matter and not anything to do with the council but anytime somebody's offering you free tickets, it ought to send up the flags, and you ought to be thinking about getting some advice before you accept them. 
Any other questions? On that? Uh, Dennis, I figure you might have some. <laughs> but if it's a $49 free ticket, <coughs> is that uh, that's a problem? Is, is that a hard and fast? That fifty dollars. Yeah, as long as it's just that one forty-nine dollar ticket, fifty dollars is the okay. is the cutoff. They they needed to cut it off somewhere, and fifty dollars is the cutoff. So at forty-nine dollars, you could accept it. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> even, even if it's pr quid pro quo? No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's some cheap votes right there. Yeah. <laughs> I would really expect my counts in that. $49. Yeah. That's a quid pro quo. I, and I have to say that um, this council in particular has been assiduous, and we've, we've been very circumspect in every, every, every time it comes up, anything that might be constitute a violation of uh, open meeting, um, a conflict of interest, that I, I have, we've attended the MMA conference where I heard of other communities that <laughs> that they, they they don't even give a passing nod to it and wait until they're busted in some level. Um, one of the things the things that you pointed in and have touched on is the the most frequent violation that I'm aware of, at least the one that makes the paper the most, is um, executive meetings and how to go into executive session. There are some. Uh, Communities that go into executive session at the drop of a hat and uh, and not legally, not this one, not this one, and the same with the release of executive meeting minutes when they're no longer standing. So, so, yeah. I'm getting a phone call. Okay, um, so yeah, I, I I I want everyone to understand that that I think we really, so far as what I've seen from other communities, no one's been so attentive to this particular these particular issues as we have. And, and and any time that I've seen a violation that's been minor and completely inadvertent and you know easily corrected. Mm -hmm. But it's always best to ask advice if you have a, a question and I'm just down on King Street so let me know if you ever need me. And I look forward to working with all of you this term. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Alan. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm the presiding officer by under the new rules that we uh, voted for last uh, just just weeks ago. Actually, um, previously uh, the person, the presiding officer in this event would have been the, the most senior uh, in membership, and I, I think you'll recall the last time we convened like this, uh, Council of Barge took over so um, this is kind of new for all of us but we move up to this point where we're accepting nominations to establish the presiding officer uh, the council president for the for this body so I'll accept nominations council LeBarge. yes um, I would like to place um, our council president right now as our council president for a nomination on the floor Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and the motion's been made and second. Is there are there any other nominations? Uh, I'll accept the motion okay. to close the nominations. Move to close nominations. Second it. All those in favor of closing nominations, please say aye. 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 Um, and I don't know if this requires a roll call, but I'll ask for a roll call if that's okay. <clears throat> okay. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the election of the uh, Vice President. Councilor Murphy. I'd like to uh, nominate Councilor O'Donnell. I'll second that. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell's been nominated and seconded. Are there other nominations? Um, I'll accept the motion to close nominations. Move to close nomination. Uh, motion's made and seconded. Any uh, all those in favor of closing nominations, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, any discussion on the nominations? 
Roll call, please, ma'am. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. By acclamation, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. I'd also like to commend uh, the former vice president of the council, the first vice president of the city council, Councillor Adams, and uh, um, and grateful for your past your past help and covering my butt when I was around. You did it quite ably, and thank you. All right, so we have our officers. Now, uh, next up comes the, the very um, august position of enrollment committee, and I would like to appoint Councilor Adams and Councilor Klein without any objection. <laughs> From the appointees, <laughs> are there any objections? Okay, then so it's done. That doesn't require a vote. <coughs> and now, guess what? Our council rules. The council rules that were approved um, for this council the previous session. But this is where we actually decide whether we actually want to uh, adopt those rules and conform to them in the remaining term. So I'll accept a motion first. Uh, move to adopt the council rules. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Yeah. There's, I think, and maybe now might not be the time, probably need some further discussion, but there was, uh, for instance, I w was considering amending, um, as I had mentioned before, the rule that requires us to uh, reappoint and then uh, require an oath from the administrative assistant. Um, but, I, you know, cobbling it here probably is not the best time we can adopt that later. So, um, this will be first reading of rules. I'm not sure how the council wants to pr proceed with that. We may actually break precedent even <laughs> and suspend rules in order to have a second reading tonight for a full acceptance of the rules. But we are, we, I think, in first reading, it's safe to assume that we will be functioning under the rules as they stand now, and, and it doesn't necessarily require a second reading. And Dennis, just for, for, for clarification purposes, I think that um, to adopt, we, and this is also part of our rules, that we have what are all two readings, but point in fact are two votes for each issue, allowing time in between the initial vote for the opportunity for new information to be presented or challenges. Um, usually between council, the two council meetings. Um, and then we suspend rules sometimes in order to expedite um, certain things, particularly things that are like our pending contracts and the like and stuff. So you'll hear various reasons for both. But in this instance, we're going to probably just do a first reading. So, uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Just to speak to the point you just raised about the number of votes. <coughs> In the rules that we've approved last year and we're voting on again today, we did, we did um, provide that they would only require one vote for amendments or approval. Oh, really? Oh, that won't happen until, we, oh, well, although we did accept those rules, so, yeah. to go into effect as of this meeting. It's a very metaphysical question. <laughs> it is. It's true. Councilor Adams. You clarify that, please. The, well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, we specify a certain number of things that only require one vote instead of two, like administrative orders, licenses, approval of minutes, and we also put amendments to our rules in that list. And the intention was to have only one vote required. I guess because we could always suspend our rules with one vote too. So it seems logical. And it only affects us, it's not really a problem. So. So what's what's your opinion? Do you think that those rules that we adopted then apply now? My opinion is we we adopted the rules last session to be effective this year, but we have a new council, so it's appropriate to vote again to sort of ratify them. Is there anything in the charter that says that we're required to vote on our rules at this meeting? There could be. No, I don't think there is. I don't know. No. Council. No, and in no. fact, the charter is strange because it says that technically our rule should be an ordinance. <clears throat> Which makes no sense. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But so no. So the answer is no. Once again, our assiduous attention to <laughs> procedure <laughs> protocol. Yeah. 
<coughs> well, the motions are made and seconded for, to, uh, to adopt the rules that uh, we approved previously. Is there any discussion on those rules? Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Just a, j just a comment. Uh, lest anyone think that I might want there to be some delay since I just arrived, I watched the last meeting of the Council on TV where this was discussed, and I also sat in on a meeting of the, the Ordinance Committee where this was discussed, so I feel fully aware of the, the new rules we're about to adopt. So you're feeling up to speed on this, okay. <coughs> well, then you're ahead of some of us. <laughs> so. Don't quiz me on it. <laughs> Um, okay, and I, this could be a voice vote as well, but why not do the roll call on this, on the rules, anyway? Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sherrod? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Um, the rules are adopted on first reading. Okay, now we... Now we're up to our, our calendar. This is the, the order to set date and time of the 2016-2017 City Council meetings. Um, you'll see before you. That's. What is this? Oh, that's the holiday schedule. Where is it on this? this. Where is that? Separate sheet of paper that. I've seen it. It's yeah, I know the this paper packet is it's very confusing. Yeah. Um, it's towards the last quarter of your uh, packets. Yes. And if you like, I can read off the dates. Um, we will not be convening this coming Thursday because this meeting counts as the first one of this of uh, this month. The next meeting would be January 21st. Uh, following that, January, uh, February 4th, February 18, uh, March 3rd, March 17, April 7, April 21, May 5, May 19, June 2, June 16, July 7, July 21st, August 4th, August 18th, September 1st, September 15th, October 6th, October 20, November 3rd, November 17th, December 1st, December 15th, January 5th, uh, 2017, January 19th, uh, 2017, February 2, uh, 2nd, February 16 of the same year, March 2nd, March 16, Mar April 6th, April 20, May 4th, May 18th, June 1st, June 18th, July 6th, July 20th, August 3rd, August 17th, September 7th, September 21, August 5th, October 19th, November 2nd, November 16th, December 7th, which is a Pearl Harbor Day. Yep. Um, and December 21st. You'll note that we are previous, we only met once in the July. months of July and the once in the, and once in the month of August. So this is open to discussion and, and, and uh, decide but there they two meetings have been suggested so council yes I, I was just going to bring that Wait, up about first would you put it on the floor please would you move to put it on the floor yes the, I'd like to move states? to put it on the floor okay is there a second okay there you go okay thank you um, for quite a while um, we've had one meeting in July and one meeting in August and many counselors that I have worked with for a long period of time really enjoyed that because they were able to make plans to go on vacations with their families and so forth. But there was always an understanding that just in case we needed another meeting, that there would be one put in place for either the month of July or August. And if you recall, this year, uh, we did meet another twice in July, and we did meet in twice in August. But those were uh, special circumstances: were appointments of uh, of a new uh, fire a police chief and a new fire chief. Uh, we don't expect that to happen every year. So, yep. Councilor Adams, did you have a? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's necessary to have two. 
unless unless if counselors can recall and I can't off the top of my head if only having one in those two months meant excessively long agendas for the first meeting of the next you know for the next meeting mm -hmm. if so I'd, I'd rather have two regular length meetings and excessively long meetings like um, I think one of the other reasons we did it sometimes the committees don't meet that often in the summer if there's nothing coming forward because a lot, a lot of what the committees do require staff support and well, staff takes vacations so a lot of times there isn't there aren't items in the in the chain that need to be dealt with <clears throat> in, in the summer and if we move you know if we if we stick if we set two people can plan around we don't have quorum problems where you're trying to have a meeting and I don't remember that was an issue when we were doing sure. the chiefs who's in town because we you know we, we weren't planning a meeting the other thing that we may want to think about for July if if we do decide to have one meeting in July I might suggest we make it July 14th <clears throat> because the we can make changes in the previous fiscal year up until the 15th right. and a lot of times the finance director likes that extra week to bring together anything that she needs us to deal with before the 15th of the month and, and 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 total out everything for the previous fiscal year so if we do decide to have one meeting in July I might suggest in 16 we do it on the 14th which is the second Thursday but it gives her the maximum amount of time to get everything she needs to have adjusted together and then we could and then we could approve it on the 14th uh, a day before the deadline um, the August meeting there's no particular deadline but the July one because of her ability to balance off her last fiscal year you know it's nice to give her all the physical time possible to do that it's a good point. makes sense an excellent good point. point that would be <clears throat> july 13th the following year then yes for the 2017 that would be the Thursday before <clears throat> the death so uh i, I so in my hearing, I haven't heard of this made as an amendment. Has there been an amendment made to uh, to convene once in the month of July and once in the month of August? I would make that amendment request. Second it. Okay. That with, with, with the July date being July, four, the one meeting in July being the fourteenth, the second Thursday second. or the fourteenth, the August meeting. I mean, we could do when we whenever we wanted to as far as I'm concerned there's no there's no financial deadline or anything that I know of for July or for August are there suggestions for which day we should meet in August could make the second as well they're just to well it sticks it smack dab in the middle of the month so um, it's harder for travel yeah so I'm not sure if people do plan vacations <coughs> um, you might want to do it at the beginning or at the end leave it the third yeah because yeah. yeah. then we meet right away in fourth September anyway so yeah you don't want to move it too close to the end so that would be the it would be August 4th on 2016 and August 3rd on 2017 August 4th counselor yeah um, so the first meeting the first meeting right or I, I you know mm -hmm. you could do it August 18th if we did that um, that would be in the middle of the month. I'd, I personally don't have a problem with that. I don't know if anyone else. Would. What, for August eighteenth, you mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just making that suggestion. But if somebody else, you know, rentals, for instance, uh, <laughs> usually that, it's a Thursday. It'd be a little awkward. So for some people, if they if I don't have I don't have a rental plan, so. Councilor Klein. We also have the possibility now of uh, meeting, coming remotely to meetings. So That's should there be an issue in the summer, we should be able to put that into effect with our new technology. Our Jew is technology. Of course, we can't all convene <laughs> remotely. You have to have a quorum here. Yeah, you have to have a quorum in attendance. Um, so, so far as it stands, <clears throat> the amendment is to have one meeting for the month of July, one meeting for the month of August for both 2016 and 2017. The uh, July meeting would be the Thursday before the 15th, which was uh, the 14th on 2016 and the 13th <coughs> on 2017. 
Um, the August meeting, any preference? I like what you had stated, Councilor. The, the, the August eighteenth. The eighth. Eighteenth. I, I really don't care. <laughs> I think you were suggesting the eighteenth was less preferable. <clears throat> Yeah, that was what I was thinking. But I mean, honestly, I don't think it gives you the longest stretch on interrupted right. right. okay. okay. Oh, okay. The, the other good thing about the 18th, now that I think about it in retrospect, puts us closer to the September meeting. <clears throat> As Councillor Adams said, I mean, our first meeting in September was a honker. Mm -hmm. That was, there were a number of special circumstances. We can't anticipate these things. We never but, know. But it, that, it was a long meeting. In fact, I don't think we finished our business on that first day, on that no, we September. Didn't. So the closer, uh, most issues will be fresher in people's minds by the time we come to the first meeting. So why don't we do? Why don't we do the 18th? What the <clears> heck? <throat> okay. So the amendment is the 18th, and then would be subsequently be the 17th on uh, uh, 2017. What was the date? The 20th. For 2017, it would be September 17th, which I believe is Thursday. September? August. August. August, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. August, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any further discussion on this as amended? Just yeah. a question. So is, is it the case that once this is uh, the speaking schedule is, uh, is, <coughs> it is, it is locked in, there's no ability uh, in the next two years to, to alter it? That's not true. That's not true. No, we can change it. This is actually this is principally for for the public and also for us to follow what we do. We can convene anytime under uh, a quasi emergency or as on an as needed basis. So we can actually have more meetings, uh, less meetings if if it doesn't seem practicable. That then the council can decide when would be the best time. To I, I haven't run into that. Where we've actually not had a meeting, but it's not it's not beyond <clears throat> normal possibility. So, all right, uh, all, uh, Councilor Shera. Did we did we decide July twenty seventeen? Uh, July twenty seventeen is the thirteenth. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll repeat the amendment, and then we can vote on the amendment, which is. Convening um, once in July and August for both 2016 and 2017. The July date would be uh, the 14th, <coughs> and the uh, for 2017, uh, 2016, and 2017 would be the 13th, and then uh, the August meeting would be the 18th for 2016, and it would be the 17th for 2017. First of all, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And all those in favor of the calendar, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That's our calendar. Um, going deep into the future. That's first reading. That's right. It is in order. Okay. <laughs> so that's our first reading for that. The. Um, the, now, the administrative items, the instructions for online training for the conflict of interest law, which uh, uh, city solicitor referred to, you, um, I don't have the URL, but I, we can get you the URL. I, I have it in a, in a draft email. Right. Okay, so you'll be getting it. Pam will send you I an do. email. The, the, it's a test, but you keep taking it till you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and... Uh, it really is pretty much common sense. Did you and already send that today? No, no, she's she's oh, drafting yeah, now. We'll send it to you. This is it's this is the website right here. It's this mass.gov website, and then it has online training on the bottom. You have to print out the last the certificate and provide that to the city clerk. I see. It has to be done every two years. Yeah. Okay. So I will send you the link for that. Okay. There's also in your packet, there's a little um, paper thing having to do with ethics training. Yes. And there's a separate page that says that you receive the materials and need to give that to the city clerk as well. So if you wouldn't mind 
filling in that information <coughs> for me before we leave today, and I can get that to her first thing. What's that? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's right after it's the <coughs> thing in your packet for the state ethics, and then and then there's a separate page. No. That asks you to fill in the information on the bottom that I need to give to her. Thank you. Oh, the state ethics. I see. Yeah, and then the next page comes No, the single page by itself. Yes. Now, it is my intention by the next meeting, before the next meeting, to have the committee assignments made. But you'll also find Pam was kind enough to actually generate this preference sheet. Yes. If you could fill this out and submit it. And I and I know the counselors in the past have, we used to do it, you know, number them in order of your preference. Um, and some counselors just put one and then put nothing else on anything else. It's, it really, it, we have less committees now, so it actually makes this somewhat more challenging except four members for each committee. Um, but it would be my, it would help me a That's great a deal if I had a sense of your priorities and what your secondary choices would be. Um, that would be very helpful. Because essentially, you know, Trying to create a seating list at a family uh, dinner, <laughs> just sort of trying to make make everyone happy with what they've got, or <coughs> equally unhappy. <laughs> Try to be more unfair and more unhappy. But this is the part I dread the most as council president, just committee assignments. So, um, so if you can get that to. You get it to Pam as soon as possible. That'd be great. And then Pam can digest it with me. Make sure you put your name on the top. <laughs> That's very <laughs> helpful. Wind up. <laughs> it's very helpful. You don't put. You don't submit your name. You are. We don't have a doghouse committee. So. When's the negotiation period? <laughs> the negotiation. <laughs> uh, Councilors are welcome to speak to me or call me uh, individually about. Whatever committees and their preferences and making the forty nine dollar gifts, forty nine dollar <laughs> gifts, <laughs> the form courtside tickets yeah, on a payment plan. <laughs> if you don't give us the committees you want, you right. have to deal with us at the wow. municipal conference, which is the day after that council meeting and the next day. So. Oh yeah, no way, no way, no way, <laughs> no way, no way, no way. So you want numbers? Do you? <laughs> um, and then. It says prepared materials, but I don't. Yeah. Know. So I have, I have in that. In, now. Before, before you throw away all of the goodies that I gave you, you want to take note that there are some helpful things in here for you that you probably wouldn't get elsewhere, like um, uh, a directory for the city uh, employees and, and their phone numbers and that sort of thing. And there's also a contact sheet for all of the counselors. Your phone numbers. You may already have some plugged into your to your phones or whatever, but you, you have Councilor Bidwell's number added to that as well. So before you you know toss all that stuff, you may want to go through it and see if there's something that might be useful. When do we have these committee papers brought to her? As soon as soon as as soon as possible. I you know the sooner the better, Councilor Klein. I think um, our list uh, doesn't have commissions. The choice list is that intentional? <coughs> commissions? Page? I know. Like, oh, you, you, you mean mixed opinion. commissions yeah. that are under administrative assignment? Um, that's not on here, but you, uh, please list those, the ones that you're interested in. Transportation parking is a good example. Yeah. <coughs> Sustainability. Use commission. Sustainability, youth energy. mission, energy. Yep, disabilities. Um, and um, assignment will be to two, including commissions. I, I haven't done the math yet, but that's pot. Yeah, I mean, it seems likely. Um, okay. Councilor Carney. My question was was about the um, the listing. This is the public listing. Okay. So if I have a uh, if I also have a mobile 
comment <coughs> that I would share with my colleagues that wouldn't go on here. Because I didn't want to make that assumption and pass it out, but right. if, you're, if you're comfortable with it, I can send it through email. And yes, that and, I could for my colleagues on the council. I have a separate private one. Oh, okay. Right, that I, that I didn't want to assume that it was okay and just put it out there and then have somebody say, I didn't want it. Someone's right. No, but I, I do want to let my colleagues know, have that way it reach me if we can. Okay. And, and one more question. That, that separate sheet of the state ethics doesn't seem to have a line for the signature. Am I seeing that wrong, or is there just signatures? The name goes on it. I'm going to walk over to show you. Yeah, it doesn't. See, if, if, oh, is that Being that the commissions are not listed, does that mean yeah, that? I would just put it there. So no, I mean, no, Pam, Pam wrote this, and 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 as a courtesy to me, I didn't I didn't even ask. Okay, her, so it's not a criticism. Obviously. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So I the, the commissions, the commission assignments. So there. Okay. So, in so far as that goes, if you just indicate to me which commissions you're interested in, that'd be helpful. Could you just list which ones there are? <laughs> yeah, let me see. I think we listed some of them, uh, maybe all of them. Transportation, sustainability, youth. U youth Commission, uh, disabilities. <laughs> What's that? Where do we Does that exist? The disabilities, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's actually, related. yeah. They, in fact, they enjoy a special authority that was granted by a uh, um, uh, uh, legislative petition. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually can, they have funds that they can disperse. So this actually, I mean, this is kind of irrelevant in a certain way, but because we're talking about commissions and because we do have, uh, I mean, the mayor has designed these commissions and who sits on them, but for instance, the Human Rights Commission doesn't have somebody, a representative of the right. council. Mm -hmm. Are there other commissions, though, like that, or is that the There are other one? commissions, yeah. So, you know, some again, these some of these are vestigial, and some of them were. Um, the, there are mayoral commissions that exist that do not have council membership on them and the war uh, the human rights commission was established without mandating uh council participation um and that actually when it was established had a completely different authority uh, they were they they could actually pass judgment and have hearings they can no longer do that but the fact that the council was not part of that um We'll have to. I'll talk with Pam, and we'll come up with a list of all the available commissions for councils to that uh, to sit on that that are under the aegis of the president to assign. Um, I don't think councils are exempted from soliciting or applying to say the Human Rights Commission. If they I know to. that would be the mayor's the mayor's appointment. So I should think they'd have one though, because that's just important. Well, you know, the mayor's youth commission, it's a non-voting role, it's its advisory only, and that's another vestigial thing. The councilors don't vote, the council just serves, but that's a, it's the mayor's youth commission, it's not youth commission for the city council. So these are the things that we have to, we're still sussing out and sifting to so try. What about like veterans? Veterans actually is mandated to uh, you have to we have to have a veterans committee that meets one at least once a year and so that's incorporated we mark that in two or I don't that's in that's or incorporated in, in like the new yeah, yeah. And that one also okay. yeah. so that but that disability is, is two disability now serves as a separate you guys I have I think you're unique in the state so as we change it yeah and so in that respect that would that would um, have to be an appointment that's not part of these it's not enfolded into one of these committees right. so with that with that caveat and <laughs> so Pam and I have some work to do uh, it means Pam has work to do that's I say that I will Pam will help guide me and, and we'll figure this out um, I have let's see I don't think I have any other announcements beyond the ones that we just made. And are there any information requests? And no new business, I'm guessing. So I will accept a, a motion to adjourn. Motion adjourn. to adjourn. Second. 
Uh, non-debatable emotion. It's emotion. It's emotion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all very much, and Thank looking you. forward to the next few years. Thank you.